printed and folded your clothes and truncated and sliced and diced today. So stay close to it and if you make a mistake, which I just remembered we did, uh, you'll see for the offering that we have some crazy things in the model and don't think the notes uh, for the page four. Yeah. It's the offertory from the liturgy. It's awful and we won't do it. We'll do the one you know by heart and that is uh, let the vineyards when we get there. All right, let's remember our baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Um, please be seated. So I do want to teach you um, the liturgy, but I think it's important for me to teach you about the history of the liturgy, which can be pretty dry and boring. So I hope you brought, um, or had some coffee, or tea, or whatever you want, because I'm not a I'm not much one for nostalgia. I, I try real hard not to be the guy who says, you know, I was a great athlete in high school, right? Because it's backwards looking. And I try to be forward looking, knowing that there's a past that's behind me that builds me, that puts me in a community, right? The past is important, but you can't live in it. You're going that way, right? If you're going that way, you're going to be in a bad way. I mean, Jesus himself says so. Whoever uh, lays hold of the plow, looking back, is not fit for the kingdom of God. Right? So it's pretty important, especially for a pastor, if I'm going to lead a congregation to go forward. But I got caught by surprise uh, this week. It's crazy. I was in the grocery store, and a song by Pearl Jam came on the radio that they had in there. And I remember thinking immediately, wow, I remember when the song came out. Uh, it perfect melody. The harmonizations are so lovely. Uh, a song called Black off of the record 10. I'm sure everybody has it. It's one of the greatest records ever made. Uh, right? You got, you're all nodding your heads. It's Pearl Jam 10. And uh, I remember the, the, uh, the girl I was dating at the time. And I remember being in Chicago, uh, 20 years old, blossoming, letting my wings spread like a fly away, like a bird. Right? Wouldn't you like to do that? And that's exactly what I was doing over 30 years ago. Now, I don't understand how that happened, how I got caught thinking about 30 years ago that I was looking at bananas or something. And it caught me, right? There's nostalgia for the past. You know, and I was thinking, man, what a perfect song. Why bother going forward? Because that song's perfect. All music. From the beginning of the history of the world until 1993 was for that moment. And then all music that's come is just an answer to that. You can never match how good that stuff was and how great Chicago was in 1993 and how pretty that girl was. You know, it's nostalgic, right? And then I threw a touchdown. But it doesn't matter. See, and I was thinking, you know, this, this must be what it, it's like. Get old. And I was thinking, I wonder if you're 90. How many 90 year olds? We have 90 year olds here? If you're 90, uh, you were 20 in 1954, let's say. And I looked it up. What were the top songs in 1954 that sounds fresh today, seven years later, as they did the day you first heard it on the radio because you were coming of age, you were spreading your name. Let's see, Perry Como wanted. Rosemary Clooney. The crew cuts. Shaboom. Right. Uh, Joe Stafford. Uh, Eddie Fisher, that's a good one. Uh, let's see, we've got the four aces, three coins in the fountain. Oh my gosh, what a song, right? Young at Heart by Frank Sinatra, 1954. Rosemary Clooney again. Uh, let's see, you got the gay lords, little shooting in your dad's amore, Dean Martin and Lewis. I think it was still before they even broke up. Martin and Lewis were still together. I think that might have been his first song after they broke up. I'm not sure. Nat King Cole, answer me, my mom. Tony Bennett, Stranger in Paradise. Doris Day, holy moly. Uh, okay, Star, Dan Cook, Don Cornell, Pat Perry, Como again. Tony Bennett was just beginning his career. And then you had a little, uh, you had a little, a little one there. You may, you may recognize this one. Shake, rattle, and roll. Bill Haley and his comments. The little rock and roll was already started. But 
just beginning in 1954. Right? It's fresh today as it was the day you heard it 70 years later. Isn't it? It's great. Nostalgia. Um, let's say you're not on and you're a young whippersnapper of 70. You would have been 20 years old in 1974. Let's take a look at what the top 30 songs were in 1974. Barbara Streisand, the way we were 50 years ago. It's fresh today as the day was in heard, right? For me, it's old people music. I was born in 1973, right? Uh, let's see. Dancing Machine, Jackson 5, Grand Funk Railroad, The Streak, Ray Stevens, Comedy Stuff, so that stuff is still around. Benny and the Jets, Elton John, I hear that song once a week, I feel like I'm really sitting around. Aretha Franklin, you got uh, uh, Show and Tell by Howard Wilson, uh, John Denver, Sunshine on My Shoulder. Wow, right? 50 years ago. Band on the Run, Paul McCartney, and you've also got uh, Oh My My by uh, uh, Ringo, which means, as solo artist, that the Beatles had already come and gone. And Elvis is no longer with us. So we did 20 years, and Elvis and the Beatles have already done their entire career arcs. So that's uh, between 70 and 90. That's your 20 years old. And that music is as fresh today as it was the day you were born. Or sorry, the way it was when you heard it for the first time you were 20. What am I getting at? You, you can kind of see what I'm going after. Uh, if you're a little younger than I am, and all of you in here, especially if you're life, kind of lifelong Lutherans, if you're my age or older, if you're younger, you don't know this. You used to be you only had one liturgy to choose from. It was the T L H. Page 5 and 15. Remember that? A lot of people do. Page 5 and 15. The T L H. Yeah. Got to memorize it. Yeah. Have it memorized. Absolutely. It was the only one you did. You did it every Sunday. Every Sunday you did the exact same church service. And it comes out of the Easter. It really does. Uh, back in the Re Reformation, there was no liturgy. The Roman Catholics didn't have one. And then when the Reformation happened and you had a Catholic and Lutheran, there was no, there was no real liturgy. In fact, that was part of the whole history of the Reformation, Counter-Reformation, is that when it's arguing over, well, you don't do the liturgy, well, yes, you do. No, we don't. Yeah, it's like 30 or 40 different forms floating around. And then the Lutherans, of course, got kicked out of their own home country, and they ended up in England during the time of King Henry VIII. You know King Henry VIII. He had a bunch of wives. They all ended up in bed, except one or two, right? Yeah, how did the boys and wives? Well, the Lutherans thought that they would make a, a nominal alliance with Henry VIII, but you can't make an alliance with him in the 80s. He's, he's for him in the 80s. And pretty soon the Lutherans found themselves being persecuted by him in the 80s. And so they fled to Scotland. And they stayed there and persecuted for a while. And we have all the immigration in the 17th and 18th century to this great country. Right? And the Lutherans started settling in Pennsylvania and the mountains of, uh, mountains of Virginia and North Carolina. And they didn't have a liturgy, but they had something kind of resembling one from Scotland. And it's sort of like percolated and it was all frontier, you know, getting over the Appalachian Mountains. And then all the Scandinavians went north through Canada and dropped into Minnesota and Nebraska. You have to say it like that if you're from Nebraska. Nebraska, Iowa. And you have all these Lutheran factions all over the country and they're trying to come up with a service. And in the 1880s, they kind of did it. And that came through in 1941, right before the war, they published one. And it was flawed right from the beginning, page 5 and 15. Flawed. Everybody knew it, but everybody loved it because it was their service, right? It's ours. And a lot of people came up with that. And it's the service of our childhood. And it's the service when a lot of you came to be adults. And so you remember it fondly, right? But at the time of its publication, everybody knew that it needed to be fixed. And they started working on it right away. But you had the war. You had the 50s happening, which was something. Then you had the 60s happening, which was something. And finally, in the 70s, they started getting their act together. And in 1978, they finally fixed it. And they threw the whole thing out and brought in the, the blue hymnal, the El Pali. The blue worship. You, you've used that. You've used it almost all the way up to the day before I came. And you got to write this one. Right? And everybody screamed bloody murder. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people screamed bloody murder. They just threw out the old one. The 
don't do that. You don't throw out the old one. And they were wrong to do that. But Divine Service 1, which we do a lot, uh, is what happens when you let university professors write the music. For those of you watching on the internet, I'm just being a little tongue-in-cheek here. It's very university professor driven. It sounds <coughs> like what you would expect in a music class at college, right? It's not something you would go pay money to go sit and listen to. It's something you would have to, you know, write an exam on later on. But out of that, you get this is the feast. And I'll tell you this, I think, I don't have any proof of this, but I think, because I've, I've seen this, I think this is the feast is known by more people on earth today than any Beatles song. All sorts of Christians all over the world singing this is the feast. It's really interesting. I mean you wouldn't you wouldn't think that but caught on and everybody loves that song is a liturgy song. Also, I'm at the last page of the book. And you gotta remember in 1978 I was five and I was a pastor's kid and I had to go to all the church services. How many church services did I go to? All of them. And I didn't like being in church because I was five and I wanted to be outside playing with frogs and dirt, right? That's what a five year old's supposed to be doing. Not sitting in church, having your mother do this to you every time you wiggle. And at the very end of it, it says that the, the, uh, you've got the uh, benediction and then a lovely little thing called silent prayer. No last hymn, no closing hymn. I rejoiced as a five year old. Look at that. We're not going to have to suffer through the closing them. <clears throat> but, you know, and everybody squawked. We ought to have a closing them. And, you know, little David Duke was crestfallen and broken hearted. Two church services on Sunday, and every time church had a sin, another whole in. But it made an impression on me. The church service is over after the benediction. It really is, theologically speaking. It's over. And you can do whatever you want. It's all like, uh, you know, the uh, powdered sugar on top of the icing of the cake. Whatever you want, I don't care. But I'm begging you, please, for the sake of fire over the day, please, please put the candles out during the last hymn. Okay? <laughs> Not after the last hymn, during the last hymn, so that we can go, you know. Uh, we're done. God gave us some things He wanted to give us. I've done my work. Let's get out of here. Why do we want to be in here? There's donuts. Okay. That's, that's the, but I have a feeling that some of you approach the extinguishing of the candles with fear and trepidation that, you know, if you do it wrong, that some pastor's going to break open the roof and glower at you until you know it that way. You know, that's nostalgia and tradition. That's the grip it has on you. Don't just... Done. God's service is over. God did his thing. That's this one. And it lasted a while until about 1997. They started working on stuff because they knew the music was university stuff and really heavy and people didn't really like it or love it. Uh, and you get moved by Hendel something in 97. That's 1997. And that turned into the red end. So 1997. That was 27 years ago. Alright? So you know they're working on a new one too. See, why shouldn't they? It's perfect, isn't it? It's from when I was 20 years old or whatever. The, you know what I'm saying? When I was a kid, we did it. It was good enough for me, but it, it, it was the same thing. Pearl Jam. Black. 1983. Perfect song. Right? You'll know, though, every single one of those church services is basically the same in form. And I'll talk about that in a couple of weeks as I continue this series. Why do we have the forms? All right, that's enough of that. Why don't we go on with the rest of the church service? First things first, we will watch Jesus collect our prayers. It's the collar. He will collect our prayers. We pray in our hand. That's uh, the next thing we'll do. We're on page two, the salutation collect of the day. Please rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Mercy, my Father, your patience and loving kindness toward us have no end. Granted by your Holy Spirit, we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. 
Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote in this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked him. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come in here. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Please be seated for the hymn of the day.
But these Pharisees know that Moses gives them an out. They cite Deuteronomy 24. Now, I have no idea why the people who built up our rating system paired up Mark 10 here, this section, with Genesis 2. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, yeah, Jesus cites Genesis 2, but the contention of Mark 10 is clearly Deuteronomy 24. And uh, the contention, uh, you know, when I say contention, I'm guessing that especially if you've ever been through a divorce, you know exactly what I mean when I say contention. The legalese, I mean. The legalese behind this trickery is Deuteronomy 24. And the details of that law are very interesting. And it gave the Pharisees wiggle room away from the created word of God. Or so they thought. And that wiggle room is where all the mischief is, isn't it? Always has been. Sex and sexuality. It's all the rage. Nowadays, not paying attention. Here's Deuteronomy 24. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, and puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination, you shall not be sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. Right away, who's doing the defiling? The men. The men are doing the defiling. They are defiling this woman with easy entry and easy exit. The men are the ones defiling the woman, and that's why Jesus leaps so hard and so fast with both feet. Because of your hardness of heart. Deuteronomy 24 is not about regulation and order. It is plainly about the hardness of heart. The created order does not even begin to consider that hardness of heart so that if your wife makes you bad soup before the main course, you just write a certificate of divorce and put it in her hand and send her out of the house and start chasing that nurse in the poor pet's team ring. In that way, you screwed up the promised land, which is how that little exceptional rule for divorce comes to an end. You shall not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God has given you for inheritance. Hardness of heart screws up, not divorce and remarriage. Now, you can sit there and you can judge the unmarried people. You can, or you marry the way you unmarried. You can judge the divorced people in our midst. You can go ahead and do that and find yourself grossly in hell where their worm never dies and their fire. Because it's not about divorce and remarriage. It's not about taking off the boxes and getting done with the charter of all the boxes to take it there again. It's about more hardness of heart, which I demonstrated to you just now from a married man's perspective and a pastor. I have to be extra careful about these things. How the hardness of my heart appears instantly like that, unbidden, uncalled for. There it is in secret. I sin against my own body, against my wife. And against God and God only. Now, you divorce people, however, are certainly not off the hook because, in as much as I hide my adulterous heart from the world, the whole world sees that somewhere in your marriage there was hardness of heart. You broke something that belongs to the unexpected created order, male and female. He created them. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Remember to demonstrate. Christ's relationship to his people, the church, and you out of the broken. What are you divorced people going to do? Or are you going to do the same thing that us undivorced people do? We take our adulterous hearts to Jesus. We with it tucked away and hidden, you with a broken marriage. And we all together say, as one people, well, Jesus. There it is. As for Jesus, he takes up our broken hearts and our broken marriages, and he takes them to the cross and there he kills them. 
Man, what a mess. Sex and sexuality. Am I right? What a filthy rotten mess. The same holy desire that when we are 20 drives us together as male and female in the image of God. And it's corrupted. That desire is corrupted and nasty and drives us apart. And it drives us to easy entry and easy exit. And we want a certificate to justify ourselves. Short certificate of me justify ourselves in any way we can. Baptism, my friends. Baptism washes it all the way. And those of us who have contended with our hardness of our now have peace. That's the salt of fire that Jesus was talking about earlier, last week we mentioned. It. Jesus brings this kingdom of fire to us. And just like fire, it can do us an enormous harm. But in Jesus, the same fire can do us an enormous good. Fire burns away a multitude of evil things. Salt kills a multitude of evil things. You know, get some fire of Christ in your heart. Get close to it, where all the filth is, where it can do good and get rid of it. And look at right on the heels of this rant about divorce and remarriage, about adultery, which is really about the created order of sex and sexuality, closely related to Christ as the husband of his people, the church. Right on the heels of that, the disciples start sending children away. Jesus is already hot about the Pharisees wiggling out of marriage with a certificate, and he's already taught the disciples to crouch down and give children hugs. So now Jesus is really hot. What does he have to say to us to get us to understand that the peace of Christ, the salt of fire, is at home? It's supposed to be at home. Be kind to one another. At home. Fathers, do not provoke your children. At home. That's the apostle. Jesus is for little children to, to kiss. To this type of person belongs the kingdom of God. You have adult children who have adult grandchildren of their own. Talk to them about the peace of Christ. You have adult children who have adult children. Talk to them about the peace of Christ. You have adult children who have little children. Talk to them about the peace of Christ. You have little children. Talk to them about the peace of Christ. Be contentious with your own hardness of heart. Soften them. Go to Jesus and give him a hug for crying out loud. To those of us with the most wretched home life, where sex and sexuality is absolutely wrecked, where there are only broken hearts, there is where Jesus is most active. Where we think we're most on our own. And sex and sexuality is trying to make it, right? Whoever brings to that home the salt of fire within himself, that person brings healing and peace. Don't you see that fire is not fire? And salt is not salt. That is Jesus himself. And he breathes peace to the broken home. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For framing up interpretation, especially in all of these words that we have in church service, we have the Apostles' Creed to help us. Please rise. Let's uh, recite this. My dear Father,
Almighty and eternal God, glory to be held in reverence by all people everywhere. We give you humble and sincere thanks for the innumerable blessings that you bestowed on us, without any merit or worthiness on our part. We praise you especially for preserving for us our saving word and the holy sacraments. Grant to preserve your holy church throughout the world, pure and doctrine, and provide faithful pastors to preach your word of power. Help all who hear the word, rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send laborers into your harvest, and open the door of faith to those who do not know you. Be in mercy, bring to repentance the enemies of the church, and grant them amendment of life. Protect and defend your church in all tribulation and danger. Strengthen us and all fellow Christians to set our will fully on the grace revealed in Christ, and help us to fight the good fight of faith, that in the end, we may receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow your grace on all nations of the earth. Bless especially our country, its inhabitants, and all who are in authority. Let your glory dwell in our land, that mercy, truth, righteousness, and peace may abound in all places. We commend to you the care of our schools, so that our children may grow in useful knowledge of Christian virtue, and thus bring forth wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamity, by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, and from every other evil. Protect and prosper all who labor in their rightful callings, and let all useful arts flourish among us. Be the God and Father of the lonely and the forsaken, the helper of the sick and the needy, the comforter of the distressed, and those who sorrow, especially by name Gladys, Shirley, Ernie, Karen, Stephen, Jane and family, Don, James, Lily, and John, and now those who hear from the news.
my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. O Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy passion, your old cross of passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
rise. <clears throat> this body and blood strengthen and preserve you in the faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace.